Hello and welcome to Boothcast. On Boothcast, I speak to people who inspire me about sport, business, and their general interest. Um, today, I have on Boothcast Bart Deswart. Now, Bart is a four times winner of the 11 City Tour. He's a winner of the world's longest paddle race, the Yukon 1000. He's a four times winner of that event. He's also done many sub expeditions to Greenland, the Arctic, Africa, Nepal, Ethiopia. He's a former 24 hour distance record race record holder. Um, so that, that's paddling obviously uh, as long as you can for 24 hours. He's done solo nonstop crossings. He's basically the endurance man of stand up paddling. Um, this episode is brought to you by Starboard Sub. Um, they're innovators, they're, they're pioneers, and they've been around for over 25 years. If you want to find out more, check out sup.star-board.com. Now, Bart, uh, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah, you're welcome. Cool. Yeah, so how is everything going over there in Hawaii at the moment? You're getting a few waves, um, as we spoke about just before. Yeah, winter starting. So that means uh, for us, winter doesn't mean it's getting cold or rainy or things like that. For us, winter means that we're going to get waves yeah and uh, the summer normally is uh, no waves a lot of wind winter is less wave less wind more more waves and um, yeah normally october is the time when uh, the first big storms pass by japan and then they pull through uh towards uh, canada siberia um, siberia that area and then um yeah we get some big swells yeah, it sounds, pretty, it sounds like it's going to be a pretty fun uh, winter for you guys. It's coming into summer for us and we're getting some downwind. But let's start, let's start with a bit of your background. Can you tell us a little bit about where you're from, um, how you got involved in ocean sports and what have been sort of like your main loves um, over your life? Um, yeah, so I, I'm from Holland and my parents used to have a windsurfing uh, or sailing school and then at some point windsurfing started. So they started a windsurfing school at the same time. And I always enjoyed that. And then everybody always asked me, like, if you, are you going to do the same thing when you, when you get older? And I, um, I always said, like, yeah, I like it, but I want to do it somewhere where it's warmer because the seasons are very short and it's always rainy and it's always cold. And it's only a couple of months where it really works. So basically that's uh, what I did. Uh, and I started the windsurfing, um, or I worked for Windsurf Center, then met my wife, started the windsurfing center in Venezuela with her, and later on in Greece, and now it's in Hawaii. So you got involved uh, in windsurfing at a very young age. Um, was that sort of like the main sport you did? And how did you get to these places like Venezuela and Greece before you eventually moved to Maui? Like, was that just a general progression of wanting to do windsurfing more and wanting to be on the ocean more? Yeah, um, yeah, I, I was really into windsurfing. Like I, when I was in the, even in the in middle school, I went windsurfing before my school. So I woke up really early, went on one hour windsurfing, then jumped on my bike, raced to school, and then um, I always liked traveling. My 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 dad used to have a, a charter business at the same time with a sailing boat going to France, Mediterranean, and later in the Caribbean with guests. And so we came around quite a lot. And I always love to travel, love to be in see other countries. Um, so I decided to go to the School for Tourism, Marketing and Tourism. And basically after a year, you can do a, an internship. And I wanted to get away as quick as possible. So the first opportunity I got, it's just pure coincidence that I ended up here because at some point I was going to Africa, but then one person uh, snapped it in front of me. Uh, there, there was a, they were doing safaris, but um, the other person had, um, he, he was way more in line because he, he was already there for two years. So he was more experienced in the school, so he had to go there. Uh, but then I found my own uh, through a windsurf tour operator and he, um, he wanted to set up something in Greece. So I went there for him. And then I met another windsurfing school where I became manager. And the year after I had my own school in Venezuela. Um, yeah, in a really short, <laughs> short story. So I progressed really quick. And the only problem is I still had to finish my school. 
And so I did it, but I basically did it um, in the distance. I Every now and then I came back to Holland for a week, pulled through a lot of uh, exams. And then uh, after six years, I finally had my paper. So when you, so what year were you born? Where I was born? No, well, no when, 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 when and where? So in 70 in Holland. 1970 in Holland. Yeah. And where you grew up, was that on like, it was like, like on the, I don't know, I don't know what the, the seas are called. It's like this at the North Sea or something like that up there or what? Yeah, what is it's the North Sea, that, that, that's correct. But Holland is basically full with small lakes. And we actually lived on a houseboat on one of those lakes where the sailing school was right behind us. Yeah. Uh, so when it was windy, the whole, you know, I was, the ball boat was going up and I so I knew exactly how, how good it was and how windy it was. And for me, it was super easy to jump in the water just for an hour and, um, and then, you know, go on with my day. And yeah, it was, it was a cool way to grow up. It was simple because houseboat is, is small and, and simple, but it, it was really connected with the water. And so you obviously you you grew up on the water. You were you and you got involved in windsurfing at a very young age. Like when did you first start windsurfing, and what was it about windsurfing that you really wanted to do it? Like what made you what what drew you to it? Um. Yeah, it was it was just a. I, I started sailing probably earlier, but I, when I was five year old years old, the first windsurf boards came to hall, to the school to our school just two. And which was also the first year that windsurfing came to Holland. And our school had one of the first 10 boards, I think. And then I noticed that it was super cool when I, you know, I was five years old. So it was, it looked cute when this little boy was doing something which nobody ever saw in Holland then yet. So in the beginning, my father, he cut a sail from something small, from a bigger sail, cut it small. And, um, so I, I noticed that it was, uh, you know, I was showing off basically. And at the same time, I really enjoyed it. And I got, yeah, as kids, you, 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 you learn really quick. So I got pretty quick, uh, good enough at it that I, um, I went out all year in the winter, in the summer and uh, any kind of wind. And then um, started racing, started going to waves. Uh, but back then it was big boards. It was, it was different than it is now. And when you were young, did you like, did you do it competitively? Yes. Did you go into like the wind and the waves a little bit? Like, was it, is it similar to what it is now where like guys are doing double loops and jumping and all that sort of stuff? Or was it more wave riding? Like I was actually up with uh, Scotty McCurcher up at three mile recently and I was watching him. I'd never actually really watched windsurfing before, but obviously it was more wave riding back then. Yes. Uh, what was, what was the scene sort of like when you were growing up? Yeah. The scene was very different in the beginning. It was, it was, there, there was no wave riding. There was freestyle was called. That meant you, you put the board on the rail and you were, you do all kinds of tricks with the sail. Like what you were doing at the, the starboard shoot yes, recently. Yes, exactly. Yeah. That, that's what it was. Yes. Yeah. And um, then those big boards started to go in the waves. First in, here in Hawaii. And then we started to do it in Europe too. And then the boards got smaller and smaller. And that's actually when the, the sports start to go down in population. Uh, because it got harder and harder, you needed more and more wind. And then people started, um, yeah, less people started windsurfing, which which basically killed the sport a little by little. But so now it's only small boards. And having said that, now you see the next progression again, that, that everything is on a foil. And that opens a whole new world. Like suddenly everybody's interested in racing again in, in the Olympic class on foils. And uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's amazing how that sport evolved over all those years. Yeah, so you're doing a lot of um, windsurfing, like obviously it was progressing through um, Hawaii and Europe. And um, were you, did you do it as a competitive windsurfer as well? Yeah, a little bit, a little bit freestyle, a little bit racing, but actually at a quite a uh, later age, when I was 18, 19, and soon after that I already left the country. so. Not much. Yeah. Yeah. So it was just all about fun for you. And it was about the lifestyle more than it was about sort of competing and trying to be the best. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I always had in my head and I actually only did it later to do crossings. Uh, there was a, there was a guy, it was called Arnaud de Rosnay. 
and he was a baron in France and he was doing all kind of crazy stuff um, between islands and between countries and um, I think his, his 10th or 11th crossing he actually got lost and he's never found he he went between uh, China and Taiwan but I, he, I mean the, not that part but he was an inspiration for me to do those those crossing especially back then there was no no gps it was it was a very different story and um i even had a plan to go from uh south to north america and all kind of things but that never worked out and but yeah that that seed was still there so later i basically started doing those things with with stand up so the period between when you're a kid and you're going and you're in middle school and you're setting and you're going down into Venezuela, which is in South America. Yeah. Yeah. And you're setting up your windsurfing school there and you're obviously windsurfing, wave sailing, all this sort of stuff. When did sort of stand up paddling come into it? Because you wouldn't have seen stand up paddling until you were sort of late 30s. So you would have been windsurfing all the way up to that. Yes. Yeah. Just, just windsurfing and a little bit of surfing. Not much, but we were living here in Maui back then. And in 2000, I think in 2004 is the first time I saw it. Laird Hamilton going down one way from way on the outside. And he surfed it all the way to the beach, which in Hokipa is very hard to do because the last part is basically no real wave. Yeah. But he had a really long board and he made that work. And I was super impressed. And... I, st I started to see him more and more and didn't think much of it. Um, then we left, we bought a, a, a boat, an old boat, and we started sailing around the world for three years. And after one and a half year, we came back to Maui for a couple months during our trip actually, because in, in, during the hurricane season in the Pacific, you basically cannot move with the sailing boat. So we, we anchored the boat in New Zealand and we went back to Hawaii knowing that we probably wanted to come back there afterwards. And then um, Sven had just been there, Sven from Starboard, and he had four prototypes of the first stand-up board ever. And one of those boards, which didn't make it, the not-so-good prototype, he left here with um, Jeff Henderson, which is a good friend of ours, and he's a sailmaker. And um, so... That was the first time I tried it myself. And uh, his cousin actually took it out in big waves and broke it in three pieces. And so <laughs> then I said, okay, now it's broken. Now it's worth nothing anymore. So then I, um, I asked uh, Jeff and Sven if I could have that board, just take it on board because I saw it on, on the boat. It's a perfect thing to have. Yeah. First of all, it's, it's, it's really local. You can, you can pedal to people who are normally in outriggers or in little canoes, and you kind of more like them other than, uh, you know, we normally use an outboard, and it's very different when you come with your little motor. I like that part, and I saw the potential to go in tiny little waves or big waves and, and all kind of condition. The next trip was actually going to go in Indonesia, so I thought it was perfect. So I took it to New Zealand, put it back together, and uh, started pedaling. Yeah, it's quite a cool so thing. So you would say you'd almost credit Laird Hamilton in your eyes for sort of opening the sport to the masses and sort of creating that sort of stand-up paddling scene. Or was there other guys stand-up paddling before Laird? There, there were, but they were all inspired by Laird uh, here yeah. in Maui. Ma Laird yeah. was the first one who tried it. Uh, Dave Kalama started doing it and the, a few other guys, but... The only one I ever saw was Laird Hamilton doing it and he made it look so easy and he went out in, in, in big conditions. And so, yeah, he, for me, it was the inspiration. And talking about these expeditions that you were doing, you're inspired by the windsurfer uh, just before you mentioned, I can't remember his name, like doing those crossings. I'm not even going to try and say that name. I bought a Hosne. Is that about right? I don't know. The Hosne. Uh, I know, I know, I don't know, that'll do. Um, anyway, so did you do any, and did you end up doing any windsurfing crossings or was it all, did you really only start doing crossings when you started getting on your sail? But I think on your Instagram handle before I saw you've been to 82 countries now, something like that. So you spent a lot of years on the boat sailing different locations and the SUP was sort of like your, I guess, avenue to sort of 
become closer to these different cultures, I guess, that probably weren't as well known when you're sort of coming to these different islands and that type of thing where we've got those primitive sort of people. Um, when, when was it when you decided, okay, I wanted to, I want to do these more expedition type activities, even though you traveled a lot before? Uh, there was, there was only when I came back, um, we came back to Hawaii and then suddenly I realized that stand up became big in, in the short time of, I mean, it was not short, but in the, in the two years between, uh, seeing it, no, three years, actually three years, seeing it here for the first time coming back, seeing that a few people did it one and a half year later, suddenly everybody was doing it. And so somebody took me down for a downwinder and fell in a whole bunch of times and he made it look easy, but I had a hard time. Uh, but yeah, somehow I, I, I liked those downwinders. So I started doing those more and more. And that board was, uh, I think it was the 12 two, which was a weird size for, for that time. And it looked like a long board, but it, it was actually really fast. And I, I started beating 16 footers on that board. And so I signed up for the first races and then I became, yeah, became more serious about it. I then with that board, I actually pedaled around Maui. And I think that was also the first time when, um, right after was, uh, the first 11 cities. And we'll come back to the racing stuff, but what was it about this sort of expedition type paddling long distance place to place sort of stuff that you've really got it really involved with over the past sort of 20 years where you're sort of going island to island doing all these different adventures? Like, what is it about that or paddling around Maui? Like not many people do this type of thing. What is it about that for you that sort of keeps you wanting to do it and what draws you to it? Yeah, it's, it's a little, little bit like a mountain climber. It, it's, it's a challenge and um, it's not so much measuring yourself against other people, but it's more measuring yourself against elements or, or the, the challenge out there or the, you know, the climbing a mountain and somehow making that. And it, it's very fulfilling, I always thought. And it, it, it's the adventure in it that there's a lot of unknowns, how your body is going to react, how the weather is going to be around it if it's going to work out and the whole planning part of it, the, the um, getting your materials and your gear and everything to work. It, that whole process is, is just for me, one big adventure. And I think that's what I like about it. And is it like, and do you find that it's really fulfilling when you finish these type of journeys? Like, obviously are you talking about the planning and the setup and like actually getting to the start line is like half the journey and then actually being able to complete it. Is that, is, is it equally as rewarding when you're doing sort of like the planning to when you finish the, the paddle? Yeah, I, th I think actually that the harder the race or the harder the challenge, the more fulfilling it is. Um, it, it's also, it's a mental thing because in a hard race or a hard crossing, you go very deep and it, it's just hard in your body and it's hard mentally. And then... When you come out of it, that's a, yeah, there's a, a lot of, I don't know what happens in your, your brains there, but it, it, it's, it's um, very, very rewarding at that moment. Yeah, like, like a massive dopamine release that you get, yes. sort of get from re, 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 like getting these type of rewarding activities and sort of feel like you're almost fulfilling what you were supposed to do when you set out to do it. Maybe you were thinking about it for five years or two years or only six months or something like that, but it's, it's just a fulfilling process. And I guess, people get it yeah. from different things in their life. But for you, it's obviously that endurance type paddling. So we'll bring it back to um, racing. You talk about like you started on now, you started doing the downwinders and you started entering the local, local races there. What was the scene like in, I guess, when you got back from that first trip in like sort of 2008, 2009, what were, what was like the race scene like then? And was there many people doing it or was it really exploding where you were? It was exploding. I think there were, uh, I mean, Maui's not big, but on those races, there were two, three hundred people downwinding on the, like a butterfly effect, which was only for women. There were 500 women at one time, just for a little four mile pedal. It was not even a race, but still 500 women signed up for that. And I have never seen on the, in such a small population, so many people uh, stand up pedaling. It was new, so everybody was into it. And 
it was, I think the downwinding part was for a lot of people a challenge and made it a little more exciting. And yeah, also that scene changed big time uh, lately. Yeah, but, so um, what, do you, what do you think it was about when like stand up first came onto the scene that really drew people to it? Because it's a little bit different now. Like obviously it's a bit, a bit more mature. It's 10, 12 years down the track and you've got sort of, I guess, established places of the sport, but it's sort of going through, a, I guess, a transformational phase where it's sort of getting, I guess it's getting more competitive, but then more people are probably paddling, but less people are probably racing. So what, like, how is it really molded over that time, do you think? And do you think like stand up paddling I um, mean, back in 2008 is kind of like the, the wing foiling or the foiling of right now. Yeah, the, Maui is a weird place because a lot of things started here. Like the kiting, the, the, the windsurfing, the even foiling. I mean, it, all those things often didn't start here, but they, they were made big here. Um, yeah. And there's a lot of people here. As soon as there's something new, everybody has to try it. And you see it's the same with the wing falling now. Everybody has to try it. It's it exploded here. But the, the back then also the, the downwind especially, not much else. It was mostly the downwinding and, and the waves. Everybody yeah. had to try it. And still a lot of people stick to it. The downwinding not so much actually, surprisingly. The waves, yes. And even um, just on the other side, just just leisurely pedaling and playing around that, that's still the same it's just a downwinding part amazingly um yeah went down quite a lot here yeah it's quite interesting how different sports sort of change and evolve over time as i say like stand up still very relatively young compared to like i guess kite surfing and windsurfing and i guess surf ski paddling outrigger paddling all these different sports there's got all these different foundations in different places but What's, what's quite interesting about a place like Maui is like the culture there is kind of like you kind of do everything. Like I've spoken to a few of the guys from Maui, like Kai, I've spoken yeah. to, to Zane and even to uh, Josh and, and they, all these guys are basically, or Annie, one of the youngest, they all do kind of everything. And it's like, if something new comes on, we do that as well. Like there's no sort of like, oh no, yeah. we only stick to one certain sport. Is that something that one, firstly drew you to Maui and two, is that, like a culture that you think should be more explored around the, the place. Like, whereas people sort of are finding in, I guess in Australia or in, in different places, like we sort of just do one thing. I, I try and do a lot of different things, but we'll just do one thing. Yeah, no here. Yes. A lot of people do everything. It's, it's, especially if you're in the water, you do everything you, you, and somehow I, the, it was the same for me. I, I as much like jumping in Hokipa and body surfing, and just swimming in the waves, uh, surfing it or stand up pedaling it, or as lo long as you were playing in those waves, um, yeah, it, it's it's amazing how diverse it is there. But most people do that. Yeah, most people do outrigger, then they jump in a, a surf ski, and then they go surfing in the weekend. Yeah, and and the wing falling at the same time. So yeah, a lot <laughs> a lot of people do it all. I mean, you also have to have the time and the money to do all those things. Mm. and the the pure local local um there's also a lot of people just do outrigger or just surf yeah yeah it's definitely a time consuming um sort of vice if you're doing a lot of those different water sports like you kind of want to spend as much time on the water as you can and all these different sports give you that opportunity whether you paddle in the flat in the morning or you go surfing when it's offshore there's no swell you can do so many different things and i think it just opens up and if you love it as much as we do, like I guess it's something that you just keep going back to and you keep trying to find that new thing that makes you exciting, that makes you feel like a beginner again. Um, but sort of going through, uh, let's talk a little bit about your expedition, that first one uh, back in 2005, 2008, when you sailed around the world with your wife and daughter. Um, and that's where you sort of really got involved in stand, like taking this up onto the boat and sort of taking it around different places. Where did you go and where did you find, I guess, I don't know, because it's something that I haven't really explored. I've never really gone on a sailboat and just gone from a place to place. What is that like, like for somebody who's never done something like that before? Like, what's it like traveling from an island to the mainland or an island to a different spot? Is it challenging or is it extreme? Is it, is it quite easy? Like, can you give us a bit of an insight into that? Yeah, it's, it's different than most people think. And we noticed that actually a lot of people, like we started in Holland 
And a lot of people start in Europe, then they go to Canary Islands, then they go to the Caribbean, and either they do a little circle there or they keep going. And we've noticed that maybe one third actually d don't do what they plan to do because it's so different what they expect. You know, you all think about those perfect little islands and those palm trees and uh, beautiful reef and, you know, it's idyllic, but actually the reality is not like that. It, it's, um, if you're on a sailboat, you have to be um, very um, self, um, self-made. Like you, you should be able to repair anything with breaks because on a sailboat, a lot of things, small things break and there's mostly nobody around to help you fix it. And the other thing is, it's not always comfortable. There, you know, there's storms, there's waves. And so, and a big part, that's what most people don't realize either, that it's a big part is, is actually sailing to get somewhere. Of those three years we were sailing to get around, there were 280 days of sailing days. So almost one third of that time, you're actually moving to get to the next place. Uh, having that said that, because this, this picture is uh, it's pretty negative, but um, it, it's also the best way to explore the world because you get to the places where you normally don't get. Because most people nowadays, you fly, you get to the main, main place in a country. To get to the outer islands is, is, is very hard. If you get to the outer part of the country, it's very hard. And with a sailing boat, you get to those places and you see a lot of things most people won't ever see. You come to places where they, they, the only people they see there is three boats a year. And it's the only outside people they see in that, that little island. And so for them, it's as interesting to see you as it's for you to see them and see how they live and what they do. Um, and you realize that those idyllic, perfect little islands with the palm tree and the beautiful white beach are actually not the most interesting of the whole trip it's it's the meeting other sailors meeting other cultures and, and other people and so that's basically what what sailing is it's uh it's it's also it's it's an adventure and yeah yeah you have to have to like that the the the, the uncomfortable things with the exploration mixture if you like that together then then you're made for it yeah it sounds like you're sort of like well i say you, you got to be comfortable in the uncomfortable but then you've got to be willing to sort of reach that end of the journey and it's going to be sort of rocky and it's going to be hard and sometimes you're going to be traveling a lot as you say like you might be traveling 260 days of the year but you kind of enjoy that and you kind of really enjoy the challenge really enjoy the i guess man versus nature um as you're talking about like being sort of like that mountain climber mindset what was it like traveling with like your wife and your daughter um, was there any, like, I guess, really challenging moments where you had to really test yourselves? Like whether it was like challenging seas, like maybe an abrasive culture that you may have come across. Was there like, you may have hit a reef. Was there anything like that that happened along the way? Or was it re reasonably smooth sailing? Yeah, it's a, good, it's a good question. Most people are, first thing they ask, like, did you get any storms? Yeah. Um, that, that's the, the main question. Um, yeah, the, the, uh, on that whole trip, you always have small challenges. Luckily, nothing big. We, we didn't have any major problems. The biggest storm we had was actually in the first week when we left Holland to Portugal. Uh, Gulf of Biscay is known for quick developing uh, lows uh, with lots of wind. And back then, we didn't know the boat that well. And there was a pump which was actually working the, the wrong way when it, the boat went on its side and it started pumping water in. in sec <laughs> so, yeah, um, yeah there's things like that. And um, it's amazing that my wife still wanted to continue after that first week because we had a storm and the boat was, and it was not sinking, but water came in where it was not supposed to be. So, But uh, <clears throat> at the same time, um, as long as it's all manageable, it, it's, it's, the, it, it's mostly actually not at sea where you have the worries it's mostly more close to land when you anchored somewhere uh wind starts to pick up you're on the wrong side of 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 the bay and yeah that's that's that, that's more challenging but um we we choose a chose a road a route 
which was, um, it, we call it the barefoot route. So you basically go uh, close to the equator and stay with all the trade winds. And then it's, it's relatively easy. You don't encounter a whole lot of storms. And the wind is mostly between 10 and 25 knots. And it's not cold. And yeah, we also didn't have any any problems with with pirates or natives or things like that. It, it, it's it if you choose the places well and the and the places also the 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 areas well and the, you, you go out of the hurricane seasons, then um, it, it's not it's not that hard. Yeah, so you basically just got to do a bit of research and understand the maps, understand the weather and understand exactly what sort of waters you're going into because, yeah, you don't really want to encounter pirates or big lows or anything like that because it, I guess it could become hairy. But what do they say? If you, um, if you don't, what do I say? Prepare the, if you fail to prepare, you prepare to fail. So you obviously always prepare very well and you don't have that sort of drama. But um, which, which sort of, um, so you went obviously down through Portugal um, Canary Islands out to Venezuela. Is yeah, Caribbean, Venezuela. Then yeah. you go to the Panama Canal. Yeah. And Panama Canal, then you get to the Pacific. And the Pacific is huge, but we stayed basically close to the equator. So it's Galapagos, um, Marquesas, Tahiti, and Cook Islands, Samoa, yeah. Tonga, New Zealand. And New Zealand, we waited until the hurricane season was over in the Pacific and we can go to the next uh, part, Indian Ocean. Yep. So we did uh, the Indonesia, uh, Borneo, um, uh, Singapore, Thailand, and then to the Maldives. And then you have to choose if you go around South Africa or if you go through the Red Sea, back to Europe. And back then, there were... The, the pirate thing didn't happen yet. I mean, yeah. there was there was some stories, but it was it was relatively safe, and it basically just flared up as soon like a 24 hours in front of us was the first big um, hijack on a, on a boat uh, with 40 passengers, um, and yeah, since it happened right in front, we, we you, you cannot turn around there. You you basically keep going and hope it's all right. But and we were like with three or four other boats. And we stayed together and, and right after that, for the next five years, there was a lot of piracy in that area. Yeah. Um, yeah, we, we got lucky and we came through it. No worries. Yeah, because you went down around the South Africa. Is that what you're saying? And then no, you no, we yeah. went through the Red Sea. Uh, okay. Yeah, because that's quite a, a, a paddle around the, I think it's called the Cape of Good Hope. Um, yes. and it's, yeah, it's really quite challenging water. So it'd be quite interesting to, to go around it, I guess, in a, in a stormy season, you definitely wouldn't want to do that. Um, but yeah, so you're coming back from this trip now and what, like what drew you to events like the 11 C after you, you really got involved in Downwindy, it's kind of the exact opposite, but it was the adventure thing that I guess you really, you really drawn to. Yeah. So the, the 11 city was actually. A race, it's, it's a big ice skating race in Holland. It's, it's the, the, like the Super Bowl for the US. Yeah. The, the ice skating race is, is for Holland. Everybody stops working and nobody goes to school. And it only happens when there's enough ice. And the last time it actually happened was, I don't know, 25 years ago. Oh, okay. Uh, so so, haven't run so for nowadays, and yeah, it could be not happening. Normally it happened like every two, three years. But now it looks like it will never happen again with the climate changing and everything. Yeah, but um. So uh, after that, a lot of sports started doing the eleven seasons. Like you can do it on a bike, bicycle, on uh, skiers, on a rollerblade, on, on almost anything. Um, and I did it also in windsurfing. They they even made it a, a windsurfing race. Uh, it's a two day race, and it's quite challenging because all those canals you have to do with the windsurf board. And if the wind is uh, coming towards you on the canal, you basically have to zigzag all the way. For, for hours yeah um, and i actually pedaled the, the the second time i did it i was one of the 12 finishers there were like 60 people starting i think and the last 12 hours of that race um was uh, just pedaling because you had to have all your stuff on board 
the mast, the sail, the boom and everything, but you were allowed to pedal. So if there was no wind, you could take the mast and you were pedaling with the mast standing up. So yeah, then, just like with the then, stick through the water. Oh yeah. no. And then, um, yeah, I did that for 12 hours just to, to, to basically come one minute before they closed the race, one minute before 12 at night. Yeah. And uh, so I did 11 CD back then. So when I heard that Anna Marie was doing it, um, I wanted to be in. And she said, yeah, but it's, it's you know, it's, it's only like uh, if, if you're kind of known in the sport. And, and I was just, I was just looking, I was just starting. And then I said, well, if I pedal around Maui, then she must take me because then I, at least I show I can do those things. Yeah. And so, yeah, then she said, okay, yeah. <laughs> you can come. Yeah. And so, yeah, then I, I did it and I, I really liked uh, just uh, the, the racing um, for such a long, well, back then it was long, like five hour race was a long race. Yeah. And uh, you ended up being fourth place, I think, in the first year. And I was basically with the one, two, three, and four. We're, we're always together except the first day. And so I felt like I, I can actually, if I train a little harder, I can actually win this. And so next year, I took it very seriously. Starboard started sponsoring me. And um, then uh, I came back and, and raced again. So what ball were you paddling on in that first year? And who were you competing against? Um, I was p competing against... Um, which, which were the... Um, Eric Terrier. He was yeah. um, was there, and I was raising on a board which was fourteen foot long and thirty wide. And yeah, back then it was kind of normal. <laughs> yeah, it was a round bottom that that made it a little more tippy than than boards are now. Yeah, and and but made it also pretty fast. I I still think that board is is very competitive, even if you would raise it raise it now, not as as competitive, but for the width, you would think like, wow, this is, this is pretty good. And for the time uh, as well, it probably was pretty good. We were talking about it recently, how sort of narrow the, the race boards are now. And it's just kind of crazy, isn't it? Yes. Like, 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 like yeah, the, the board for next year won't say how wide it is, but that's pretty narrow. <laughs> yeah, I was even surprised. I was like, did we really test that? <laughs> yeah. I was like, oh, perfect. <laughs> But yeah, that's, it's crazy how small that got. It's like, it's like they took off like 10 inches. And, um, yeah, it's amazing. I mean, it, 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 is, it is a lot more tippy because back then we were not used to that. And, and I already thought that back then, like, okay, yeah, you still have to watch out. But we got used to it and the board got lower and we were basically, yeah, adjusted to those, to those boards. And they're not round bottom anymore, so they 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 it's basically more of a planing hole, and then the boards became actually combinations of a planing and the round nosey. So it's it, it's funny how Sing sixty came back um, to that from back then. The round bottom actually came back uh, a couple of years ago in yeah. that board again. Yeah, because they're probably like um, more like pintails and that type of thing as well when they first came out. Yeah. They've been sort of more designed off the, the long board, sort of big wave boards, I guess. And then they were like, oh, maybe we'll make the tail wider because it'll make it more stable. And I guess the wider your tail is and the wider your nose is, the more stability you're going to get. But you can still bring the, the rails in a little bit more. And that's where you got, you're getting the speed from. And then obviously the, the concaves yeah. and all sorts of different things that, that people design now. It's just progressed the board so quickly. But yeah, to think that's yeah, 14 by 30, like I didn't even know stand-up existed back in 2009, but um, when I saw it sort of in 2014, um, yeah, the, the boards were about 25, I think then, or 24 and a half or something like that. And that was uh, now. That was now, yes. Yeah. Yeah, it's, I think it, I raced that board only for one year and then we, we went to the ace. And I actually raced the ace, which it w was the downwind board later, but... Um, Raised the ace first. I think it was 26, and then we're 25, and then I think 24. So yeah, I, I think I raced until um, I mean last year we raced on uh, 19 and three quarter or something like that. Yeah. So yeah. yeah. And how are you finding the new boards compared to what you're racing like on then? Would you say like because I remember what we were testing at the start of the year in Thailand, and even when you saw the board, you're like, oh, it's actually quite stable. Like for the O21 boards, that oh, you're like, oh, like it's not, it doesn't, it's like a number, 
but it's, it's like it's so different to what you used to be paddling on but when you get on the board it's like oh it's not really that bad yeah i, I mean the, the, it's not as stable as they were in the the, the 30 white or the 28 yeah. white um the, the guy who actually won the first year he was on a 28 and now we were on a 30 or maybe yeah. even the, maybe even more than that right but back then it was like wow how, how can he stand on that board um yeah but it, it it did it did yeah for for me it, it is like the board now they are tippy for me they are they are tippy it's yeah. fine when it's flat water but it's it's not the same as the, the 30 white back then we were yeah we, it was quite easy <laughs> Yeah, well, I think it's. I think not only have the boards progressed, but I think the the level of rider has progressed as well. And I think people just want to get that more speed. And without that regulation, I guess with widths and weights and all that type of thing, you sort of the only thing that I think people are pretty set on at the moment is fourteen foot long. But without the sort of the regulations there, it's hard to sort of not go narrower because if you can stand on it, it's faster. But if you can't stand on it, obviously right. it's going to be slower because you're going to be in the water, and that's obviously uh, yeah. a lot harder. And you're going to use a lot more energy. But so you win, you sort of go back in 2010 and you win that the first or your first 11 city. What was that like for you? For somebody who hasn't probably strived to win events before, was it was it more of a challenge like for yourself when you're racing against yourself, or was it going in that last year like I can win that race? Like how do I how do I achieve that? And then you come back the next year and win. Was that something that sort of changed in your mindset? Yeah, no, I, I've always been very competitive. Yeah. Um, in in almost anything I do, but the I I really trained hard for it. I knew that if I would train hard, I would have a good chance, depending on how the other people would, would train. And I had the feeling I was the only one who was actually training. I was, for instance, doing upwinders, so I I trained against the wind. And I noticed that a lot of people who train, they train when the conditions were nice. Yeah. Uh, same here in Maui. People do downwind. It's only when it's good when it's when yeah. it's hauling and um. So, but if, if you do the, all those other conditions, suddenly I realized that, especially in the upwind, I was a lot better than the rest. And I, I there were a few years where uh, I still tell it to people that a sport is really nice if you're if you're you know if you're competitive and you just win it's good. But if you have this edge over everybody because you you're just better than the rest then suddenly everything is so easy. And I think there were out of the, the four wins and the one second place I got, I think there were two years where actually it, it was, I felt I was really better than the rest. Um, it was just, yeah, I could, I could easily keep up with anybody. Uh, the other years I had to work hard to win those races to get the second place. But so I, it, it, it's all about training. If, if you train enough, um, then you have a fair chance. Um, yeah, well, it's, you it's know a, this. yeah, it's a it's a forgotten skill paddling upwind. I I don't think a lot of people do it anymore. And even people I talk to in WA when like the downwind is good, and everyone goes downwind. And I do an upwind session or something with them. They're like, "What are we doing this for? Should we go downwind?" I'm like, <laughs> "Because if you get to a race, it's upwind. You can't just not paddle. You got to you got to be prepared for it. So it's all about being prepared for all those different conditions. And if you prepare yourself, you're probably going to do well. And and that's what you did. So um, in those years, were you racing against the same guys you raced in the first year, like Eric Terry and those guys, or was it you start to see different people come into the sport? Because you basically um, yeah, the, the from... second year was mostly the same people. Yeah. Uh, but from the, the years after, um, like Casper Steinfart and um, a lot, a lot of people got really good uh, in the years afterwards in in the Euro Tour and and or in the races in Europe. There was no Euro Tour back then, but. Um, most people actually only came for one or two years because the, it like Casper, the, the few years Casper came, we noticed because the, the week after the two weeks after was always the battle of the pedal. And we noticed that suddenly we were not as good anymore against the people we knew as before because we yeah. raced with them in France and we were super competitive. And then you race the 11 city and then you see the same people right after in, uh, in, in Dana point. And then you notice like, Oh, now suddenly I, I missed this little extra five, five percent, which you need to be, you know, in the, in the, the first train. Yeah. Uh, but we noticed that actually that those, that, that week 
of 25 hours of pedaling, it, it does something with your body and you, you need to recoup from that, uh, which takes, I think, like a, like a month to, to get up to speed again. Yeah. And so a lot of, a lot of competitors who wanted to do really good in, the, in those other races started to realize like, ah, maybe I shouldn't do that race because I wanted to win the, the, the battle of the pedal. Yeah. And other people, it was the other way around. They, they saw that was their main race. They wanted to do the London City because London City had been around a long time. And it, it's on most, most people's bucket list somehow. Yeah. Uh, because it, it's, it's a race and a challenge. It's, it's, it's both. And it's, it's worth, you know, it's, it's a whole week. So people, people make it a, an outing, a, a, like a little holiday. And it, it's not like one race in a weekend somewhere. And that's it. it this is a whole, it, I always call it like a, a camp for grown-ups. It's, you spend a lot of time together. So it's not only the race, but it's also the, the companionship with everybody. Yeah, I think that is quite cool with those type of events where you're going to a, a weekend location where it is kind of a community-based event where anybody can really enter and it's a challenge against the mind and the body. And that's why I guess for me personally, like stand-up paddling has always been like marathon running or something similar to that, where it's like if you're going to set up an event, you kind of want like the 2K and the 5K and the 10K and then the, the long, then the biggest challenge, which is like the marathon. But um, I, you've seen, we've seen sort of the sport get shorter and shorter and we've got like sprints now, we've got distance, technical, um, and then obviously these ultra distance events, um, surf racing, yeah. surf, sup surfing, like for you, where do you see the sport, we're sort of segueing a little bit here, but where do you see the sport going forward and what do you think is going to appeal to the most amount of people to get people to be racing? Cause you're seeing a lot of people turning up to like races like Gla Gla, uh, Nordic crossing, um, these sort of longer distance events like the 11 city tour is becoming quite popular as well. Um, it's harder for the elite athletes to do it. Cause as you say, it takes like a month to recover, but how do you see the sport sort of evolving over the time? We'll come back to the 11 city. Yeah. I, I think that the, the only thing I don't really like is the, is the 200 meter sprint evolving. Um, because that's not really what the sport is about. I think. And it becomes it becomes too much of the canoe race, the C1 canoe in the Olympic Games, where people only do it to get in the Olympics. And you never see somebody pedaling around for fun on a C1 uh, canoe. Yeah. And it, it, so it, I think it's the same with stand-up. All the other races is is I, I like the battle of the pedal style races, although they're harder to organize because you need some waves and everything. Yeah, but yeah, you see more and more the, let's say the the mid level races where our mid level um, competitors go, um, but bigger, and most of those races are between ten and, and fifty kilometers. The yeah. Chatter Jack, the Glagla, those races, and I think it's popular because it's it's um it's a challenge for those people. It's if yeah. you, if you know that you're not you know you're going to be the number one or the, the top three, then you have to do it for something else. And most people do it for the challenge. So I think that's, that's for a lot of races, the way to go. Yeah. And that's I think one involvement, uh, involvement. And the other things is, um, yeah, that I, I mean, you, you told me yourself this week that it looks like that, uh, the, it, it might be an Olympic, um, um, how do you call it? A sh uh, a sh um, event? Yeah. That, oh, no, uh, an, an exhibition event. Exhibition event? In, in Paris, yeah. Well, but fingers crossed, but surfing yes. France, I believe, and the ISA are pushing for that. And it could be the Nordic crossing, from what I understand, but who knows if that's going to happen or not. But it's nice that they're actually talking about it. Right. And it, it has been, there has been talk about it for a long time. And, and it's a sport which a lot of countries do. And there's a lot of. Um, participation in a lot of countries so it has all the things you need for to be an olympic sport and so if that happens that that, that would be good for the sport i think it it, it will it yeah it, it will help the sport and yeah and i've like the, the ultra distance the ones i do the last couple of years there's quite a lot of people doing that the, yeah. most of those races between um let's say 50 and a hundred people show up and 
it, it's amazing for an event like in 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 Scotland where you have to race for it's like twelve hours minimum, and and people like to do that. Some people do it in two days, some people do it in one. But it and I think again, it's it's a challenge. Yeah, I, I really see this sport going that way. And I think as I get older as well, I think I'll be more accustomed to doing these type of like 11 cities or Yukons or Chatterjacks and these type of events where it's more of a community base and like that sort of competitive edge is not, not gone, but it's just not as important as like the whole experience that people are chasing with these type of events. They want the challenge. They're going to train for six to eight months and they go to an event. They, they, they don't really want to go and do a 20 meter split, get knocked out the first round. Like they want to, go and do a, a 25 kilometer race and feel really satisfied and then go, okay, what's my next challenge for next year? Cause you have events for, for most people who don't have the time to do a lot of training. They pick one sport for the year. They take off their leave for, for the year and, and they book their race. that They're going to do a year down the track. Um, it's obviously a bit harder at the moment, but regularly that's what they do. So they want, they want, if they're going to go to an event, they want that real challenge. And I think that's where I see that sort of distance paddling aspect that people are going to really enjoy. And, I think it really relates to those people who are going down and buying the inflatables or buying the, the 10 sixes or the touring boards, that type of thing. They can really relate to that type of paddling. But when we make it too elitist and too sort of away from what stand up paddling is to a lot of people and, and the culture around stand up paddling, I think it becomes a bit um, confusing and it sort of becomes a whole different sport away from yeah. stand up paddling in a way, as you say, it kind of becomes more like canoeing. Um, but Look, if, if, if it gets in the Olympics and it and gets more people paddling, I think that's fantastic. It'll bring in junior programs, it'll bring in government funding, it'll bring in clubs, it'll bring in so many different things that stand-up paddling doesn't have right now. Whereas stand-up paddling is kind of really organic with like the way that events are run, with the people who love the sport, who are pushing the sport, who are making the sport go to the next level. But I think if something like this happens, I think it will be fantastic for the sport. And you'll have, I just think you'll have more people getting involved because for whatever reason, it just changes the way that people look at things. Yeah. Yeah, we'll I hope. Uh, I, yeah, we'll see. <laughs> anyway, we'll come back. We'll come back to Eleven City Tour. Um, so you win that four times over, from like 2010 to 2013, yeah. and then have you been racing it sort of since then? And, and sort of you've seen sort of Bruno and Daniel sort of come into a bit of dominance. Um, I think one of the Tahitians won it one year. Like, how have you yes. seen that that event evolve? Um, yeah. So the first. Let's see, I was fourth place and then um, in between I was one second and the rest I was first place and then, then the Tahitians came. And it, it, I, I, knew, I knew that it was going to be a harder, um, a harder race because I've been building house, a house here and you know, I've, I've, we have work too. So, you know, if you don't put in the time as much, there's a, a big chance that um, it, it's not going to work out. And yeah, the Tahitians, they, uh, they, they were strong that year. He, he was just stronger than, uh, than anybody else, also than, than Bruno and Daniel. But it, it, it was the same thing for them because they didn't win, but they, 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 you know, they smelled the, the roses. They, they thought like, oh, I see if I train hard, I can actually win this. And so they came back the next year and I, I'm not sure. I, I think Bruno won that year. Yeah, and like 2015 or something like that. Yes. Yeah. yeah. And so I've been coming back every year. I've yeah. done all, I think almost all the five-day races, sometimes both, the, the non-stop and the five-day. Um, the, yeah, then I started doing more of the, 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 the ultra-distance race. But it, it was interesting to see that, that yeah, you see a certain time somebody's good and then somebody takes over and then they're good and there will be a time that, that Bruno or Daniel uh, will be, you know, they'll, they'll be the next person. And I think now Bruno got, he got four wins under his belt. So it's, it's even. Um, but I think, I think um, Daniel is still very hungry too. So he, I think he wants to come back and, and get another win because he has he had only one win. Yeah. Um, it's all about motivation and training. And if you yeah, if you have those those two yeah. in yeah, order. You can't, 
you really can't hide in a race like that. You've got to be able, you've got to have the kilometers under you. Yeah. Otherwise you're just going to be found out really, really quickly. And yeah. it, it, you do the, you do the 24 hour nonstop as well. Um, what's the, yeah, like, the what's last couple of years like? I've done that. Um, it's, uh, yeah, it was just in line with all, all the things I was doing. So for me, it was actually easier or more, I was more competitive in, in 24 hours than, than the, the short, because nowadays, if you do all those longer distance races, you notice that you start to become slower in the shorter distance. Yeah. My, my, my explos uh, explosive um, yep. Power. Uh, racing, pedaling, and uh, also the, like the high average is slower. I, I am really good in 10 hours on a certain average, yeah. but that hour of just a little faster is my muscles are not used to it anymore. So I started doing those and I think I got second a couple of times. And is that to, is it Nick who who's winning it yeah, now? Nick, is that Nick, won, Nick yes, he, he, he won the, the two times I did it, he won. Yeah. And it's a, it's a, it's a very interesting race to do it because it's 24 hours roughly. And so you have to go the, through the night and for a lot of people, that's very different. So yeah. food and sleep management start to be yeah, important. And yeah. that makes it for people who did the race on, in the five day race before and transitioned the, mostly the first year they don't do well. Because and it's, is, it's, it, is it more mental? Is it physical? Is it a combination of all those yeah, things? Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's both and at some point the, the physical becomes mental and um, because after let's say five six hours things start to hurt and then it becomes mental yeah and you just have to keep going with that same pace uh it's all about the just a high average pace and if you can keep that all the way through and just somehow pedal through the pain and don't slow down when you because when you start to become tired, everybody has this sleepy face at some point. Most people have yeah. it between two and four or between four and six in the night. And if you have that, you don't even notice, but you start to slow down. Yeah. And the shorter you have that period, the better it is. Um I I've, I've never used anything to because some people they you know they take caffeine or, or other pills to get through that but i've never done that because i don't think that it's, it's better to just work with your body and just see see how your body reacts um, but it's interesting to see how you what your body does in, in those yeah oh totally like well you see the difference between like a 10k race and a 20k race to a 50k race like they're sort of like the limitations that i've been through and haven't really done much further than that but you notice your body sort of changes depending on what races you're doing like the way I attack a 10k race is completely different to the way I attack a 20k race because you, your body has to be adjusting to that and you can't really go too hard too early. But and you, but you're obviously you're racing a lot higher intensity than something that like you will be doing at 11 C. You've sort of got to be really managing your your energy output, managing your, your stroke like rating, managing like how much power you're putting down, but also managing the elements. I know it gets quite windy out on those lakes, gets cold overnight. Like you might have to be battling cramps. Um, your mind might be wandering, like because you're just sort of out there by yourself for a long time. But what do you do, I guess, in these type of long distance events? And we'll get onto Yukon in a second, but what do you do in these type of long distance events where you, you set do you set your mind like sort of like some goals or do you set like I'm gonna I'm gonna paddle to this next ten kilometer mark or, or what are you sort of looking at as you're paddling along? You break it down. You you eleven city is you know, you know the five stages. So and then there's there's no the normal day stages, you have a halfway stop for fifteen minutes. So if I do the long distance version, I, I break it down in those stages. You, you know, you go to the next, next city and then you go to the break point. Um, and then you go to the next city again. And so that helps. Uh, what helps a lot for me is having a GPS. Yeah. Just to see what you're doing. Because sometimes you don't notice that you're slowing down, but with the GPS, you see it right in front of you. <laughs> And um, it, it's a little bit, you have to watch out if, if you start working it with, when it's windy. Because sometimes, you, you know, if you're pedaling with just a little bit of wind, it's already a big difference. 
And if yeah. you think like, oh, I have to go 9.5K an hour, it doesn't work that way. So it's more, it, you have to use it to just see how fast you go and then try to keep that speed. And if the conditions change, you just go with the conditions and then try to keep that speed again. Then it's a really good tool. Uh, it always helps me in, in, in the beginning. Nobody used GPS, but for me, it was, it was very important to keep a, a good pace. And, and when you're doing this, like, how, like, is there any, been any moments in these type of races for you, like maybe 11 city where you've kind of crashed and burned or you've thought, oh, I got to give up. I'm not going to be able to finish. Or has it always been just, just keep ticking it over. look at the GPS, look at the thing. Was it, is there any like key points where you're like, ah, oh, what am I doing this for? Um, no, not with 11 city. Yeah. With, with longer races. Yes. You have those points. Yeah, and um, because it's days and there's, and there's more nights, <laughs> so the different. But the eleven city is, is short enough that you got the goal in front of you. Yeah, well, from um, someone like me, it doesn't look very short. But I guess one step at no. a time. <laughs> as we build it's a, yeah, it's, it's super relative. It, it's really relative. Like with the Yukon, I know that the first time I did the Yukon, and your it it was like fifty six hours. And the last 12 hours, that's after the last, that there's a two breaks. And the last break is only 12 hours to the finish. And yeah. you really feel like that's the finish. That's, that's oh, you're doing the last stretch. Yeah. And you're almost there. And it's, it's still 12 hours. And that's, <laughs> the way we talk, that's the way we talk to each other there. Because at that break point, you see a lot of competitors. And you talk to those people. Because it's a three-hour break. So when you eat, you, you talk to them. And you talk to the, the people helping you there. And, so it's it's funny how that works that you really you're in this mindset like oh it's just the home stretch. The <laughs> home stretch and I need twelve hours to go. Yeah, but at the same time I do a race here which is an hour and the, the last mile is is could be the same feeling, it's the same home stretch, it's it's only the last five or ten minutes and then you have this exact same feeling. So it's it's super relative. So so what drew you to something like the Yukon one thousand? Because that's like is it a thousand miles or a thousand kilometers? And it's just a, it's a straight race and it's basically one of the biggest or the longest paddling races in the world. It's in the north of Canada. Can you talk us a little bit about that race and sort of not only about what it is and who does it and, and sort of like what the challenges are, but um, why, how you sort of went from sort of 11 cities to these much longer paddles? Yeah, so I, I, I noticed that I, I did well in those longer races and, and I, I came to the sport when I was in probably in your your few old already i came to the, the you know i started stand-up paddling when um 2008 seriously and then that was well, i was 38 yeah so it's quite quite late and um as you know with marathon runners there it, it's mostly the older marathon runners it's it's never the 20 year olds who win the marathons yeah and so the, the older i got the, the better i got in the longer and the, the, the worse i got in the short races yeah and yeah, it was just in line with all the crossings and all the, and the, the longer races. So you start looking for the, the longer race and the next year, the longer race. And then I heard, okay, this one is the longest race there is. So I was wanted to do that. And it's, it's 700 kilometers. Uh, it, only every two years they do the 1000, which is a thousand miles. And so it's a longer, it's a, it's an even longer race, but those, um, yeah, they, they do this race because it, it's a tradition there. Uh, the gold diggers use this route. And they used to do this with, with uh, canoes and kayaks. And so traditionally it was a, a stand-up, uh, sorry, a, a, a canoe race. But then they, at some point, we convinced them. Uh, I wrote a letter and a few other people wrote a letter. Like, can we not do this race? So after some up and down they said okay we'll, we'll allow 10 people and we'll see how it goes and they actually didn't expect us to finish they that's what i heard afterwards they 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 were surprised that most of us made the halfway point so i've got a bit of footage i'm playing in the background here i'm not sure if you can see it but so basically yeah. you're, you take, you're taking everything. You've got a spare paddle, you've got your camping equipment. You're basically, you're paddling a starboard all-star here. This is 2018. Um, but what is it like pre prepping for all that stuff? Because you basically got to take all your food, your water. It's very much a self-sufficient race, but obviously there is support if you need it. 
Uh, no, there's no support if you need it. The, the, oh, this, okay. There's two, there's two, there's two, so there's the, the two races. The Yukon, um, the normal Yukon, you don't take so much gear. You take uh, basically the, the two front one you see, the blue pack and the smaller pack. That's what you, yeah. what you need. So you just have food for about 24 hours. Uh, you drink the water from the river uh, with a little tablet to, to clean any bacteria. Yeah. And that's it. And then you, you change your food at the, at the break point. And that's the only place where you actually you, you meet uh, a helper or a friend. And this race, everybody is for himself. It's a thousand miles. There's uh, four villages along the way in the thousand miles. And the biggest village is 600 people. Yeah. And the next biggest is like a hundred. And so there's hundreds of miles where there's nobody and there's no yeah. support at all. Uh, you have to have everything with you. And uh, that's why you have so much stuff. So you have to have food for uh, 12 days actually. Uh, although you think you can do it in eight, you have to have 12, food for 12 days just in case something happens. And yeah, there's, there's only like 30,000 people living in the Yukon. Yeah. Which is the size of, uh, I don't know, a big country. Um, yeah. But there's, there's 150,000 bears. As you can see this, here's a bear. <laughs> yeah. Bear, 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 bear tracks. So how do you like, because if, you, if you're sleeping on the banks and you're sort of setting up, like, are the bears aggressive or is it just about like sort of being prepared? Like how long are you actually sleeping for if you have a break? Um, with this race, you have to uh, stop between 11 and 5 o'clock in the morning. Yeah. So there's six hours. And of those six hours, you also have to make food and, and uh, twice for the, like dinner and breakfast. So you actually sleep only for like four. Uh, but yeah, it's, uh, it, you have to be very uh, diligent about where you, you put up the tent. So normally you go on land, uh, you look around, you see if there's in any of the trees, if there's any bears. Uh, especially if you see cops, because if you see cops, you have to, you better go because uh, they get aggressive when uh, the moms get aggressive when you, when there's baby bears. Yeah. And, and you, you see if you see fresh tracks, like on that particular occasion, um, we saw tracks and we moved right away because then if this, if they're fresh, that means that they were just there. Yeah. And uh, there was actually one, one team who, didn't see any tracks, set up the tent, slept. Next morning they woke up and they, they were like a lot of tracks just around the tent. Oh, wow. So there, there's a lot of bears there that yeah, you really have to watch out. And you, you put the food, for instance, you put it away from the tent, far away. And you have to, yeah, it's, it's the, the major concern. That, that, that and, and, and hypothermia and um, yeah, overheating even. The, 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 oh, so it... And it doesn't even get it doesn't even get dark. It's it's sunlight. No, the, the, this this point actually, the, this footage you see now is exactly at twelve o'clock. It it uh, it no, it doesn't get dark. That's the darkest you get. It's wow. It's weird, and you're pedaling towards the 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 north. So even the de difference between the first and the second day and the third day and the the eight day is huge. That it, it's 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 getting lighter and lighter. At some point, it's it's it the sun is just just touching the, the horizon and it goes up again. Yeah. Wow. So when you're, so when you are prepping for a race like this, what is it like um, preparing your food, preparing like your packs and that type of thing? Like what type of, I know this is a question that people ask me all the time with like coaching and training and that type of thing. Like how do you prepare nutritionally for different types of races? Like, like for 11 city or for Yukon or for your 24 hour world record, for example, like how do you set it up? Like you're somebody who's got very, very a lot of a lot of experience in this type of thing. What would you like? How would you set yourself up for that type of Yukon race or Eleven City or any of these distant type races? Yeah, food, food is as you well know super important, especially over if it's a race anything over let's say an hour, hour and a half, it starts to be more and more important. And so I've always used um, a, a, like a, a powder drink which is made for like bikers who do races of three hours or more. Yeah. And I basically use this always as a, on the side. So when, when I drink either water or that, and I never use gels because gels, I feel only work in races of an hour, 
maximum hour and a half and anything over that they start to go against you because it's it's a short spike and in an hour race the short spike might be enough but for a longer race it, it's really it, it does also things with your stomach you don't like and and the other foods are all solids which um should be easy to take up in your body it, like bananas work and um i use a lot of uh, like nuts and the, the longer the race is the more important that you use food which is um very diverse because an eight day race like i saw people they had uh, three different bars and a hundred of those and that, that's what they ate for those eight days and it's it's horrible <laughs> so the, the, the yukon 1000 actually you do it with a partner and yeah. i told my partner who who did only the the 11 city 24 hours so that's his only experience in long distance racing i told him most important with food take a lot of different things and that's what he did and he still said although he told me i still think i didn't have enough diversity so it it yes because things don't taste the same after 24 hours of racing so some people you, some things you start liking a lot yeah some people things you you don't like at all and so it, it, the more experience you have the, the better you know those things and you know like oh this like this bar for instance i cannot eat although you love it when you eat it here like yeah. normally during the day when you're when you're in a race you don't like it you like with a dry mouth for instance it doesn't work anymore and uh, so there's a lot all those foods you have to try so for me most important in any race try the food during practice and during longer distances then you know how your body reacts and you start knowing what you like or not yeah and then what, what sort of like fluid like what sort of like food intake are you doing like let's say you're paddling for 24 hours with like four hours break like you're talking about would you have like four bananas or some peanut i suppose there's a big tub of peanut butter there like are you having breads like are you having sugars carbs like proteins like what how are you sort of mixing it up if you had a percentage wise Intake. yeah it's, it's a bit it's a big mix uh, i i didn't go uh like super scientific and try to do like 20 percent this 30 percent this because i know in in those kind of races you you try to listen to your body yeah and if it's if it's shorter it, i think you can be more scientific about it but um i know that you need like between eight and ten thousand calories and yeah. you try to um get a lot from fat actually and also because it, it's a, a slower burn than when you do a high cadence like the races you do it like the, the one or two hours of, of of almost sprinting yeah um and we basically on a on a very good average and you try to have this super consistent average for the whole time that, that's how you win races just, just to have a like if, if you if you do an eight kilometer an hour for eight days straight, that's when you win a race. Um, not when you do it for one day, 9.5 kilometers an hour, and then you start going down to like seven and a half for a long time. Yeah. So it, 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 so you, the, the food is also different, I think, for those races. And, but yeah, I, I, bananas, they don't last very long in days. So the first two days you eat a lot of bananas and I try to bring as much as I can, like eight bananas or something. And if you eat more, your body probably start doing strange things too. Um, the the liquid food, I just do it consistently, eight days long. Yeah. Always a sip. And that keeps you from crashing also, I think. Like I've never had in any of those races where I really um, bonked. Yeah. I, I never crashed. And that kind of food keeps you on a, on a certain level and very consistently yeah it just it must be quite a challenge and i guess you only really learn from experience like as you're talking about even just like i guess fundamental stuff for racing like when you're doing a distance race whether it's like short or long or short as in like 10k or long as in 100 uh, 100 like 1600 kilometers as you're talking about with the yukon it's still about best average it's still about listening to your body it's still about eating the foods that you like and, and diversifying those foods and making sure that you're able to maintain that calorie intake that you're going to need for the races but fluid intake as well but have you ever had a point where you 
drunk too much or eaten too much where it's like become a detriment to your performance? Um, no. Yeah. I, um, yeah, I think I, I know my body really well. That, that's, and you know, I know when I drink too much, at some point you, you, you feel that, 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 you know, you should stop drinking a little bit. I know when I pee a lot, I drink enough. Yeah. And I, I always drink quite a lot um, because it's, it's better to have a little bit too much than too little, for sure. Yeah. Um, of course, you don't need too much, but um, yeah, the, so that's the, the food part. But the other thing is also the, the, your, like for instance, when you get tired, you get colder and you get especially colder really quick. I know when, when you pedal for 24 hours or even 10, 12 hours, if you stop for a minute to sit down on your board to grab your food, you get so much quicker cold than when you um, normally uh, pedal for an hour or when you in, in, in normal life. So you have to know those things and, and, and react really quick on it. So uh, if you feel a little bit cold right away, you stop, put on another clothes and react on it and have clothes which really work well that you can open and close and have and ventilate or not and have have jackets which are really waterproof and things like that it it it, it sounds very basic but those actually make in, in the yukon the normal yukon race the the which is 56 hours for me and, and for some people 80. yeah it most people uh, lose the, or, or, or not finish the race. So like last year, half the people finished the race, the other half not. Those people who don't finish the race is mostly because of those small basic things. Yeah. So when you're, so there's, there's two type, there's two Yukon races. There's one that's 715 kilometers and one that's 1,000 miles. Do you, do, so do, do more people get to do the 715 kilometer race? That's the one that you've won four times, 16, 17, 18, 19. But you also did the, the 1,000 that you're talking about where you do it in a, with a partner. Um, what is the difference between those two races? Obviously, one's a bit short, one's five days, as you're talking about. But how, like, how do you approach those two different races? Uh, it, it's very different because the, the, the shorter one is, is just you. And the shorter one, I, I go way faster. I, the, I, for me, the start, for instance, is, is I sprint away and I, I try to win the race already in the, in the first mile, basically. In the other one, you don't do that. You, you know, it's, it's eight days. For, for us, it was eight days of, of, of pedaling. And so it's very different. And it's, it's, you, you try to more survive and, and not make stupid mistakes and, and not wear yourself too much out on the eight days. The other one, I know well enough that I, I can do it in a way different pace also. Yeah. And, yeah, and so the other one is, it, the shorter one is it's 150 teams i think of which yeah. most it's only 15 peddlers and the longer one is only i think with 20 teams last year or the two, in 18 so it's, it, there's not so many people want to do a race that long it, it, for, for most it's a little too far the, the, the shorter one is actually full every year yeah yeah so it's and it's you've got a, obviously a lot of challenges with that race not only like the physical and mental side that we've been speaking about with nutrition as well but the cold obviously is a, is an issue. the The water is fast flowing, from what I understand. And have you like do you fall in? Is it is there stages where you like make a mistake and you fall in, you get really cold or anything like that? Or are you are you really careful and you sort of stay on your board the whole time? No, you're really careful. I I fell in only once in all those years, uh, which was on the first day when I looked more to the back and and looked if if you know if anybody was following me or not. And the, on that, because the water is flowing fast, there's swirls. Yeah. And so you're fine until, but if you look back and a swirl hits your nose, suddenly your, your board sweeps to the side and that's when I fell off. But you try not to fall in because the water is cold. Yeah. And you know, if, if, you, if you fall in during the day, if it's sunny, it's fine. But if it's in the evening and it's four degrees, you have to change clothes right away. Otherwise, you're you're losing out big time. So you're also you're taking spare clothes as long as well as with with yeah with you, you have, as well. You have all, but how all do you dry stuff. those things? Ah, uh, you cannot. You have to have enough stuff with you to to be prepared for this. I know that if I pedal hard, 
I can warm myself up in, in almost any circumstance. Yeah. Um, but um, yeah, you have to have, uh, you, yes, you should not fall in the water in the night. It's, it's just, yeah, don't do that. Yeah. And that's why we also, there's, there's rules and I, I help making the rules with them. We, you, for instance, we cannot race with an, a super narrow all-star. I race with a 24 and a half and we yeah. set the limit to 24. Yeah. Because otherwise there's always people who go no more narrow and then the other one thinks they go more narrow and then people start falling more and then it suddenly becomes more dangerous. Yeah, because it is really dangerous, especially if there's not a lot of like access to emergency support and you kind of don't want the race to have those sort of circumstances where people do have unfortunate circumstances, I guess you could say. But And then you've got to have those rules to make sure it's safety because it's, it, is, it's quite a, it is quite a challenging race. It is you against nature, really. There's nothing really out there to help you. No, the, the, the only safety is, a, is a, a tracker. And if you're really in an emergency, you, you push the emergency button. But it's, it has to be a life-threatening situation. Yeah. And then they send a helicopter, which has yeah. never happened. But that's, that's yeah, that's the, that's the backup, basically. Yeah. So you, so you, and you've also done a lot of these different races. So sort of a little bit of South 11 City, the Yukon. You've also done the Muskoka River. You've won that four times a 220-kilometer race. Uh, you've done the Chatterjack, which is probably a bit more known, the Missouri River the Great Glen Lake Power, you've sort of won a lot of these races and set records and that type of thing. Um, can you t tell us like with all these different races that you've done, like which one would you say out of those ones are your favorite or are they all different for different reasons? Like where is the Muskoka River? Muskoka River is in, um, in Toronto, uh, close to Toronto. It's like 200 kilometers up. It's in a park. Uh, it's also a two day race. Um, it's very similar to the Yukon in a lot of regards. You have to be self-sufficient. You're not allowed to bring a GPS, for instance, with that race. You have to do everything with compass and map. Yeah. And you have to have a whole bunch of stuff with you, compulsory. Um, yeah, all, every race almost has something. It, one is more adventurous and one is more challenging and the other one is just plain hard. I really like the, the Great Glen because Scotland is just a really nice place to be. And it, it's, it's a 12 hour race, which is long enough to be challenging enough, especially the last year when the whole thing was upwind. Yeah. And, and so I, yeah, it, this, it, it's mostly adventures. And, but all of those, I, I think in all of those races, there, there has been points where I asked myself, like, why did I sign up again? Yeah. They're long yeah. enough that you have those moments. Yeah, so in Levin City, you didn't have those type of moments, but in these longer ones, you're sort of going like, yes. why am I doing that? Would that happen multiple times across the race? Or is it like, do you bring, how do you bring yourself out of that mindset? Because obviously, each people have that, even in like a 10 kilometer race, people go like, I don't want to do this anymore. Like, what am I doing it for? How do you pull yourself out of that and, and sort of keep going? It's, I think it's, uh, if you're competitive enough, and or you're, you really like the challenge, just like mountain climbing. You know, the, if you're climbing, there's a lot of mountains which are super hard and they, they suffer cold and, and severe um, the sleep deprivation. And, but they, somehow that, that goal of finishing it and, or climbing to the top or getting to the, to the end is, is um, yeah, it's the most important. So that, that's, that's what brings you out of it. I think that's what keeps you going. And because especially with stand up pedaling, at some point your whole back hurts. It's not, it's not back pain, but it's, it's all the muscles, which are all yeah. somehow hurting. And yeah, that you, you learn to live with it and then you keep going. And that just the, the, the finishing is very uh, sweet. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, and then you got to spend the month recovering afterwards. But so he's spoken, spoken a lot about your racing, um, sort of the ultra distance type of things. But I guess Chatterjack is not really that ultra distance in a way. It's only about 50 kilometers. And you've, and you've sort of done a lot of other racing as well. Like you said, so I said here, 40 international top five finishes between 2010 and 2015. What was it like sort of racing on those, I guess, was there shorter distance racing at that time? Like, were you doing, like, were you doing PPG? Was there ever a Euro tour when you were going through, like, what type of races were you doing between 2010 and 2015? Because all this, 
sort of distance stuff really started taking off after like 2015 after, yeah. for you. Yeah, there was the, there were races in Germany, in Hamburg. There were races in France. The the Sub Cup was was one of the biggest races for the world back then. Yeah, because in the beginning there were only there were only four or five races in the world where you had to go because those were the big races where everybody went. And yeah, like the Sub Cup in the beginning. Um, I, yeah, I, th that time I, w I was good enough that I I. I got first and second in, in those races. Eric Therrien got first and second in the long distance short. I mean, the other way around. But then, yeah, I was even competitive enough to do those races and and do well. Um, was, this, was, this, was that the one in Sharpoys, the Sub Cup? Uh, no, the, the Sub Cup is in uh, San Maxime. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I, I remember. Uh, that, that, that was one of the, the earlier races. In, in That was actually the. the I think 2010 I went there already, or 2009. Yeah. Early. And Hamburg too. Hamburg, I think, was the first. They called the World Cup right away. First race ever. And the, so, yeah, everybody went there. Like, everybody who was something in, in stand-up went to that race. And I think the only other big one was um, the Battle of the Battle. Yeah. And did, were you doing Battle of the Battles as well? Like. Yeah, I've, I've, I've done most of them. And... But I've never been good at those. I, I've, yeah. um, I, I had a hard time with the surf. And I was never, you know, that was, it was. That was never your the thing. Grind, the grinding the was, was always... better for me always then. Yeah, I, 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 the, the best that I did, I think, was along the long distance. I was fourth place or third place. Okay, cool. And, but, but yeah, that's it. But, but the, the, the wave ones, I, I was happy if I made them. Because the, back then there were, there were four groups and yeah. out of those four groups um a quarter went through to the final and the, the so i was happy if i made the final and the final was 25 people 30 people yeah and yeah that, that was the goal but no i was never never even close to to the guys who did really well like connor and 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 those guys and, and danny ching and they they were they were another league yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, you 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 could. I would like say horses for courses. There's uh, there's always yeah. somebody who's better at something else. And even for me, I was always better at that endurance type stuff. But I've tried to get better at the shorter stuff as well. Yeah, because um, somehow you you came, you came in. I think in a time that that it started to be more important to to have a uh, to focus on one discipline. In the beginning, yeah. everybody did everything, and some people were good at everything. Yeah. But now that 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 doesn't exist anymore. Yeah, you basically you can't you can't be good at everything anymore. Like you can't be good no. at like surfing and sprinting and, and distance and technical. You sort of got guys who are specialising in each. And I guess I've found my yeah. niche in that in that distance style stuff because and then I can sort of do a little bit of the other stuff, but not the sprinting. But um, that's never been my thing. But yeah, you've been able to. I guess and I've been lucky. A lot of the races now are going mainly distance or super short sprinting. But that, that there's no sort of in between stuff anymore. It's basically you pick one or the other. Yeah. Yeah, um, and we've spoken so much about your racing stuff. Um, I wanted to just touch a little bit on your expeditions. Like, this is the stuff that I guess you're pretty well known for and you'd have so many amazing stories. Like, 2010, it says here you went to Africa. Um, you've been to the North Sea, Greenland, Pacific. So we're going through Tahiti and Bora Bora. Um, you've done the Nepal World Stuff Expedition. And then you did, I can't even say this, Masquerade Expedition and then Vanuatu. Uh, I, think you, I think you went to Marquesas, that's it. You went to Vanuatu with uh, Trevor as well, Trevor, I'm pretty yeah. sure. Um, what, 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 like with these sub expeditions, I guess they're like kind of along the same lines as doing these distance style racing um, and sort of challenging the mind and the body and, and that sense of adventure. But when you're planning out for these type of ones, like I remember you were telling me you went from like Papiete and you went straight across the Bora Bora on the sub one time and you, you do all this type of different sort of challenges and it is really a sense of adventure, a sense of expedition, a sense of fulfillment when you get to the other end, you know, like sleeping on your board in, in the middle of like the, I don't know, the Tahiti, the Pacific Ocean. Um, what is it like doing that type of stuff? Like, can you give us a, I don't know, a story um, on one of these trips that you, you sort of really, I don't know, look back fondly on? Yeah, it's very different because there's no race element, which is, is, often nice because there's no pressure to go fast it's just about the experience and getting there and there's a lot of 
preparation involved. Um, and mostly, it's, uh, I start with Google Earth. I yeah. look at Google Earth and see, like, you know, you, you start browsing and you look at Fiji, you look there, Tonga, you look, you know, you look all around and at some point you think, like, ah, this actually works out. And then you start checking the, if the wind is in the right direction, if you can make the work to, to do a crossing from one place to the other. And um, yeah, it started all um, with the crossing here between uh, Big Island and Maui, uh, sorry, Big Island and Kauai, which was actually, I think, still the hardest crossing of uh, an expedition I did of all those things. Um, especially because you, you spent five days on a tiny board. Uh, you, you, yeah, you know how, I mean, that board was white. It was 28 white. It was a lot thinner. But with all the gear, it feels like a, a 20 inch board because it, it becomes tippier and, and you have to sleep on the board. Yeah. It, it's uh, so that what most people cannot imagine is, the, is, is that part, the, the being on the board the whole time and making your food on the board and sleeping on the board and, and making food again and, and pedaling and, and just spending five days nonstop. It, it's a very, it becomes a very small board. And that, I think that was the hardest challenge. And especially for me, the hardest was uh, being cold at night. Although you think Hawaii is very warm. Um, I was wet five days. And then when you're wet and you're not moving, when you're trying to sleep, then you become very cold. Um, so that was one thing. And then another Story so what, what, year, the, what year did you do the, oh, that was 2011, the five days, 11, five nights yeah. solo. Yeah. 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 That must've been such a challenging thing. Like, yeah, I can't imagine sleeping on my board and eating on my board and being cold during the night. I just, I don't know. I, I just can't, I can't get myself to think like that, but maybe, maybe one day, but um, at the moment, it's sort of, it sort of seems like a different world and a different mental state to be able to get. There. It is. It is. Yes. It is yeah. a very different, but that's, yeah. yeah that you have to like that somehow that, because it, it's, it, you ask yourself, you can ask yourself why you do this, but it's also the harder something is, the nicer it is to come out of it. The nicer the food taste afterwards, the nicer you think of your friends and family and your wife. And it, it yeah, it, it, you appreciate life just a lot better. And I think it's good for everybody to have this experience every now and then. And it, for some people, it's it's even just walking for 20 kilometers or 20 miles uh, that could be the same experience that's uh, that was very hard and then the first uh water you drink the cold water you're going to drink afterwards or whatever you're going to eat afterwards tastes so much better because you did that before and yeah. so it doesn't have to be that hard but th that's the main the, the i think the, the main uh idea behind it yeah, well, yeah, it's just something that's, I guess, really far-fetched for me, but I can understand the different process and it becomes relative, as you spoke about before, because I guess when you're first starting out, like a 10 km race is hard, then a 20 km race is hard, then a 50 km, like you go to Molokai or something like that, and you're like, oh, maybe I do 11 cities, and you're like, oh, what's the next challenge? And you're sort of trying to up everything you're doing, because I guess it's like an addiction. You've got to, you've got to have more to, to make it the same sort of level, because once you've done it, yeah, you've just sort of had that experience. Yeah, so you also have to watch out that you don't, it's it's like what I see with uh, the base jumping. Yeah. They, you know, it has to be crazy and crazy. At some point, they kill themselves. Yeah. And w with this, you can do that too. You can you can go too far. At some point, when I went to Greenland, the plan was to pedal from Canada to Greenland. Yeah. And and then I realized that getting close and close to it that there were no windows i was every, every time i was checking for a window of four days of, of good weather and when i saw the weather the weather window i said okay what if i would go now and then i waited four days and then two days later i realized that the weather totally changed it was super dangerous like 30 knots and and zero degrees which you cannot yeah. you cannot survive too long is it is this the one here yes yes yeah wow so you so how far is it from canada to greenland it's it's basically oh, yeah. a two-day pedal it's 200 miles it's, yeah. it's as you can see it's not too far but um it, it, the water is zero degrees which is a problem and then you're just out there by yourself no one else around 
Or that, that was a plan, but I, I actually didn't do that. I, I okay. decided not to, to do it because um, I, and uh, it's a good thing too, because later I realized that there were two kayakers who tried it and they both died. Okay. And it, it's mostly the, the change in weather conditions. It's like, this is, this is one of the nicest days you can imagine. Yeah. But a day later, it's, it's stormy and it's, it's rainy and it's, um, and it's super cold. The, the windier it is, the colder it is because the water is so cold. And because you, you're, you know, the wind comes over the water. If it's zero yeah. degrees, it, it, yeah, it becomes really cold really quick. Yeah, yeah, between my, it says here minus, between minus 15 and, and plus five. And I guess once it gets to minus 15, you, you, you just can't really handle it. Like, I'm, like, I guess when you go snow skiing and that type of thing, it's really cold, but you get to go inside and have a hot cocoa yeah. and sort of be able to warm up. Whereas out there, it's, if you're trying to sleep on your board or sleep on ice shelves or whatever you end up doing it, it just must be such a challenge. But it must be so beautiful though as well. Like it must be incredible to be out there by yourself and have that sense of nature. Yeah, this, this is what was one, I think one of the nicest, this in Africa, I think were the nicest expeditions I did. Yeah. I, it, 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 yeah. Just because it's a world you normally never see. And, and between those, where I was, was the second biggest ice calving place in the world, Ilulisat. And there's so much ice coming down there that there, you always hear noises. It, it's, it's like, uh, like lightning. It, and they, it, it's consistently moving because it breaks down and icebergs, they, they change uh, over from one side to the other if they melt. Yeah. And so, it, yeah, it's beautiful. It's, it's and you're on an, are you on an inflatable there as well? Yes. That, that was almost, that almost ruined my, because it's very hard to get there. And yeah. It's very expensive to get there. The flights are super expensive. So I decided to go with an inflatable. Yeah, and then did you, are you ever worried about like it's something happening thing to the inflatable? Like obviously the boards are very well made and that type of thing, but if you had, to, you have to like repair your board if, if something happens, like do you, ha are you prepared for that? Um, yes, I actually had a, a, a small, uh, tiny inflatable dinghy just in case this one was going to leak. Yeah. I could blow that up real quick. Um, and back then they were just working on the, on the, the double chamber inflatable, but, uh, and it, it was, it, I almost got a double inflatable, but they were not a hundred percent sure if that would be a hundred percent safe. And I was going to be the first one to try it. And we decided <laughs> there was not the, the place to try it. Yeah. No, you don't want to be trying on, on an expedition. As you say, with your food, you've got to be able to eat it beforehand before you start using it um, in a race. But so you, you got like some, are they, are they wolves or huskies or it's like chocolate? No, they, 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 yeah, people think they're wolves, but they, they're, they're yeah, race sled dogs. Uh, okay. And was like, and how far are you from like civilization and this type of thing? Like, is it quite a way? Like, how do you, like safety wise, how do you plan that? Like, do you have e-perbs or like, I guess mobile phones? Yeah, I have e-perbs, but, but I, I always plan basically everything that, that whatever happens, I should be by myself. And an EPIRB is only really if the, something goes so horribly wrong that it's a life and death situation. Yeah. Because I always thought like I cannot afford it to um, be rescued. And that would be the story that, you know, doing stupid stuff and, and getting rescued is, is, a, is a bad story. So yeah. I always had a lot of <clears throat> um, options, what, like what ifs what I could do if things go wrong. Um, yeah, luckily I never had to, uh, I had to use sometimes the options, but I never had to be rescued. Yeah. It's, it's let, just let, good to know. Yeah. 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 Oh, you've got good to know that, that maybe there's that option. If, if worse yes. comes to worse, you're going to die. You've got, you got sort of that, I guess, think, but they've still got to find you and that type of thing as well. It's not, it's not all, it's not yeah. all smooth sailing just because you push that button. Um, let's talk a little bit about the Vanuatu expedition where you went with Trevor and I guess a lot of these other ones you were doing by yourself and you're just sort of having us up sort of doing places that probably people have never paddled before down rivers going down like through Africa and that type of thing. Um, but you go with Trevor for this one through Vanuatu. What was that like traveling with someone sort of for the first time as well? Uh, it's super cool. It, it, first of all, it's, it's, it's nice to have companionship and it's way better to get photos because if you're by yourself, the media part always is, is not so good. Yeah. And 
yeah, Trevor is just a nice guy. <laughs> it, yeah. it, it works out really well. But it's um, especially that trip was very, very nice because Vanuatu is a place where not many people go. Yeah. And we went to some places where there's no, there were no tourists ever come there. Yeah. And and so you you and Vanuatu is very traditional. So you you end up going to a little village where nobody ever comes and then you present a little gift to the to the to the chief and then you ask permission if you can put up your tent and he most mostly tells you out oh, to put them right next to my my hut which we always try to avoid because it's always very loud and there's a lot of pigs and 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 a lot of animals and um so we always yeah we always try to to set it up close to the beach but it, it, but it makes it very special because they always invite us to for for dinner, and for them dinner is is very simple. It's it's mostly, it's mostly kind of a root and some uh, some coconut, and that's about it mostly. But it's a, it's it's a very simple life. But they they, what we noticed especially there was that they were all happy. The, the people are always smiling. They're always happy. And they're always talking to each other. And everybody has time there. Like you see a lot of people sitting on the trees there. And then they sit there for hours. Yeah. And then, and sometimes we sit on the beach and they, they just sit next to you. They don't even talk. They just sit there for hours. And they sometimes ask you something. Sometimes they just sit there. And so can they speak English? Like a lot of these like countries? Or is it yeah, very, they, very they have, I think, 120 languages. And... On one island, we went from one village to the next, which was only like 10 miles, and they always speak a totally different language, which the other ones don't understand at all. But at the same time, they were occupied long enough that um, by the English that they um, speak English, yes, most of them. Yeah, um, so I found some footage here as well from your solo non-supported um trip in bora bora as well like you've got such good footage out here this is i'm seeing all this footage for the first time I'm just sort of researching stuff in the background but you might you yeah, must just see some incredible things um by yourself and you're sort of seeing just so much of nature and, and different things um it must be quite incredible like you're sort of preparing for it here and you've had a lot of um, involvement i guess in, in the starboard touring range and, and the race board range as well what are you looking for with your boards when you're designing when you design them for these sort of expeditions? Right, but yeah, what you just saw now is one of the things that for the expeditions you want you want to be prepared for for the the not ideal conditions. So if the wind suddenly starts to come from the side, it's fine in the race. Yeah, it's, you know, it's not nice, but it's it's fine in the race. But if it's a whole day or longer, it's it's starting to be a problem. And so you, you start to put things in the front, like I had a front rudder or I had small fins in the front to keep the nose from being pushed away. So you, it was actually easy to go with the wind from the side for days. And so those are all small things and you, you start to look like how can you put gear on the board and how can you make it stable and still fast at the same time. Yeah. Um, a lot of those small things. Yeah, and because you also got a lot of weight on the board as well, so you kind of want a little bit more volume as well to sort of float you when you when you got a lot of weight on that board. Yes, and like this board, which was actually a mistake, we we made a little um, compartment so the weight would sit really deep in the board. Uh, but the problem is that the compartment was always full with water, so it, it was actually a lot of extra weight. Yeah. And, in, in the beginning, it was not a problem because I put all my water there, my fresh water, because in the sea, you have to have fresh water. And so it was always full. But the, the more I drank the water, the, the more it became full with seawater. And so, yeah, you make mistakes too. Um, and how, how, do you, how do you sleep on your board when it's blowing like 25 knots? Or, or does it generally get calm in the ocean at nighttime? Because this is the, one of the ones where you did sleep on your board as well. Like, how are you managing to sleep when when you're moving around so much? Um, I have a, I always had an extra pedal, and the extra pedal I put sideways on the board, and I have two oh, little floaters, yeah. and the floaters work like little amas. Yeah, and that helps the board stabilize a little bit more. Yeah, uh, but still, I think during this trip, I flipped over twice, and on the other trip. I flipped over four times. 
which is always horrible because it, it, it happens in the night when you're in your little cocoon on the board. And the worst is when you're, when you're really sleeping. Most of the times you feel it coming. You, you feel like, oh, okay, the wind's picking up, little rollers. Yeah. And you, you hear the white water coming, so you already lean over to the side. But yes, I had, I had it once where I was sleeping and then rolled over. And you, yeah, you, you, wake, you wake up pretty quickly. Yeah, well, I guess you would wake up pretty quickly. And like, do you, have you ever lost equipment when these type of things have happened? Um, the, the first time I rolled over, um, I lost my camera. I was actually <sighs> making a picture of how I was sleeping in the water, uh, like yeah. in, on the, uh, at night. And yeah, I, I didn't fix it to, because everything is, is tied to the board. Everything has a little rope and it has extra tie to the board. And I think that's the only thing I ever lost uh, because there's some things you cannot lose. Some things you, yeah. you, you yeah. And so the, 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 the most, uh, the biggest safety on, on those trips when you're that far and alone away from everybody is to stay with the board because you, you cannot swim for those miles to, to, to land because sometimes you're like a hundred miles away from, from land. Are you, are you leashed to are you leashed to the board obviously yes i'm I'm leashed and i actually if if things get rough i'm leashed leashed double yeah it's, it's just because in the night it, it cannot happen that that you you know the board is heavy and if the board takes off and your leash breaks that you cannot find your board anymore so i have two leashes and there was actually one incident where i had um i even tied a rope around my middle just to be 100 percent sure that that's nothing can go wrong yeah yeah it must be such a, a challenging thing to do when you're out there like just i don't know I, honestly like it's hard for me to wrap my head around got you that your some of your expeditions and some of your paddles and some of the things that you've done but it's quite incredible i guess going forward like do you have more trips planned are there things that you want to do going down in the future you, like i know you're involved with starboard you've got your own shop on on the island there in maui um, you, you sort of, I saw you've been doing wing foiling and, and different things as well. Like what's, what are you sort of planning in the works for say the next 10 years or something like that? Do you want to continue doing this type of stuff? Yeah. The good thing is what I do, you can do quite long and yeah. you get slower over time, but <laughs> you, you can still do it. Uh, especially the, the expedition part. So I, 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 yeah, I still looking for special places to go and, and, and it's not so much more the challenge, it's more the, the adventure nowadays. Um, I've, I've had challenges enough, which were hard enough that I, that's, uh, for me, that's fine. I don't, I don't really need that anymore. And then, but the adventures is, is still what's, what's, what's out there. And there's, there's so many places where it's super cool to pedal to or around or from. Yeah. And so, yeah, that part, um, I probably still do some races um, and yeah, the, 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 the new plan, uh, which is, is uh, the only thing I will say about it is to do something with the boats uh, com combined with, with um, water sports. Um, okay. and what I, have, I, I cannot say at the moment, I cannot say too much more about it. In two weeks I can say more, but yes. Okay, well, some, we look forward to the announcement. Some things have been finalized before, yes. Yeah. yeah, okay. So you're sort of planning some things to do with a boat, more paddling, a bit more, I guess, footage and some, some cool new videos of, of a new expedition that you're planning, but we're not really sure where it is or what, you, what you're planning. So you just got to yeah. finalize a few things before you release it. Yeah, that's pretty, that's pretty exciting. And for you, um, I guess, being, uh, I think, about 50, I, I guess. I'm yeah. Sure. Yeah. How is it sort of being a waterman at this age compared to being a waterman, say in your twenties? Like, how are you seeing? How have you seen your body progress? And so, if you had to break it down into like decades, what would you sort of say? Um, like, you, when you were younger, was it was it like easier? Was it faster? Was it more fun? Or was it have things changed? As perspectives got as you've gotten older. It's funny you ask because I asked the same question to my dad just two days yeah. ago. <laughs> okay. Well, well, you're twenty years older than me, so it's good to know. So, what, what am I leading up to for the next twenty years? No, the, the, the biggest thing you realize in, in, um, in, in competitiveness is that you, if you, if you, you, because you can get to a really high level, but you lose it pretty quick. 
So if you want to stay at that level, you have to keep training. I know this is when I was younger, you get to a certain level and for weeks you stay at that level, even if you take it more easy. If I want to stay at that level, I have to keep training. I cannot yeah. stop for two weeks. That's the biggest thing. Um, yeah, I'm not sure if it's the, the age or the, 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 the type of racing I did that you start to become slower. It, it's probably both, but um, I know especially the, the more long distance I day, the slower I got in the short distance. And yeah, of course you don't have the explosion anymore. So yeah, you have to, I, I basically have to do those, those other races, but like even in the cheddar Jack, you, which is a quite a fast race, you, you can still do good if you, if you're trained. And, but, um, yeah, you have to watch out a little more for, for injuries. Uh, but the, the good thing is, and that's, the, that's basically what my dad said too, said, as long as you st still keep doing all those things, um, you're still fit and you're still not too prone to, to, um, to injuries. And it, it's all about the mindset, I think. Because if, if I see some of friends or family back in Europe, which are in a totally different lifestyle. They close totally different. They, they act to totally different. They, they do different things. And they, for them, it's such a world apart. Yeah. Um, but here, living in Maui, yeah, if, it, if it's good, every morning I go pedal. Uh, yeah. Either on a race board or on, on a, now it's winter, on, on a surfboard. Um, but yeah. And if it's windy, you go windsurf or you go wing. And so that it, it all around, evolves around that. And I, I, that keeps you young. It, I see it on Maui. There's a lot of people here, which are 75, 80. And you see that when they walk to the beach, you can see, oh, they're old. But as soon yeah. as they jump on the windsurf board, you think, gee, is he 80, really? Yeah. So it's amazing how they still do those things. And of course, they learn it at a younger age. But as long as yeah. they keep doing that, it, it keeps them young. I yeah. hope that works for me too. <laughs> and, and is it what is it about when you sit, when you're at fifty? Um, obviously, there's guys at eighty sort of still windsurfing that type of thing. But do you still get the same enjoyment out of like all these sports as you did when you were twenty? Well, I st uh, still see like with the the, the stand up surfing. Yes, it's like I'm one of the few when it's really really big out pedaling and that still is, is so fulfilling. And it, it, sometimes I notice that it's not even catching the biggest wave. It's just making it out, which is sometimes hard enough. Yeah. And being there totally by yourself, surrounded by those giant waves is, is yeah, it's special. And so I lost the, lost the mind, but today. Yeah, it's just, it's just special for you to get out through yeah. the break on your stand-up and you're just enjoying, uh, I guess, the, the different challenges as you get older, the different uh, perspective, I guess, changes. You're not probably as, as useful and, and as, you haven't got the explosiveness and you haven't probably got the strength that you used to have, but you still love being out there. You still love challenging yourself and you still love, obviously, learning new things because you, you wing oh, that's, yeah, you that's around, so Learning so new. new things. The, the, yeah. the winging, for instance, I see a lot of old wind servers, which are a lot older than me, um, who have been professional in the past or surfers who have been professional in the past and all, all big watermen, but they, they're like kids. They, they enjoy yeah. so much learning this. And you know, you know it because you have, you're doing this too. But learning this, this new sport from the start and feeling a total beginner again in the beginning yeah. is, is, I think is, is uh, ageless. It's, it's, that feeling is exactly the same for me as when I was, um, doing my first windsurfing yeah. at the beginning and trying to figure out how it works and everything is, is with the winging is exactly the same. So yeah, I think that's, that's just in us. And it, yeah, it's matter. totally priceless. That type of thing. Like I've been learning how to, well, I've done a bit of foil down for the past couple of years, but sort of only in the in season, which is only just starting now in November and probably runs through till January, February to get the trade winds here in Perth. But a lot of the time I'm away as well. Cause I've been doing a lot of racing. So I haven't spent much time on it, but I've been doing a lot more about the downwinding now. Like I've been doing a little bit more prone surfing on, on the foil, shortboard surfing, um, doing the, obviously the sup 
foiling and now doing the winging, which is my first wind sport. But it's so different for me, but it's so like enjoyable because you see that exponential progression, which you don't get from like, if I go stop paddling now, like I'm not going to get exponential possession, like progression. I'm going to get maybe 1%. If I'm really lucky and I work for like six months, I might get 1%, but at least I can get like 20% in a day. If I just keep going right. out and back, like I was up in Exmouth recently and I was at Wabiri and I was doing these jibes, which I'd never really done before because I've never done wind sports. I was like, Oh, I, like, I did like, eight out of 10 jibes. I'm like, Oh, this is amazing. How good is this? Like, you know, like I still can't get out to the waves. I can go back and forth and I'm not getting, I don't have to do the walk of shame by having to walk back. And it's like, it's just so cool to see that progress. And I think yeah. that for someone like you and, and still progressing, I'm sure there's other sports. I hopefully will jump into as I get older and I'll try and learn these different things as well. But it's so cool that you can still learn these sports are different like at, at, at 50 or at 80 or like, it doesn't really matter. There's, it's kind of ageless. If you've got a little bit of, talent you got a bit of um, love for something and, you, and you're consistent you can definitely learn yeah i actually noticed that the biggest difference in um when i was doing freestyle windsurfing and i was 20 20 22 23 then the, the freestyle changed it became all planing freestyle really fast planning uh, maneuvers and i learned really quick but then i noticed and then I did the centers and I was like 28 and I already noticed there's a huge difference. If you're 20, those tricks were super easy to pick up with 28, yeah. the, the, um, especially the, the fast maneuvers, they were suddenly very hard. Like it's the same with skateboarding. I think Th those very specific movements are very difficult, uh, to learn when you're older that, that, yeah. So that, for me, that was actually the biggest difference where I, we, when I was what I saw with age yeah. that something my teachers were picking up stuff so much quicker than I was. Yeah. Um, it's, but it's also that I think it's that, that risk risk reward thing as well at like 18 to 20 or 18 to 25. There's not as much at stake. Like it's who cares. Like you haven't got the family that you, that like you have to look after. Like you're not potentially going to really injure yourself. It's going to put you out of work. You haven't got like, you haven't got income to worry about and that type of thing. So it becomes a little bit different. I think when you're, you're careless and like if if you're carefree at 18 and 20 so you're happy to do that double loop and break your foot but at 30 you like even for me i'm like i don't want to try that stuff i'm just gonna go and do whatever's safe and i'll still have a good time but i don't need to be the best at something like that so i, I think it just it changes and you become more calculated in your decision yeah. because for you you don't want to go out and i don't know get pounded at jaws or something like that you'll be a little bit maybe a little bit safer than maybe what you would have been at 20 you know so it's just I think it's a changing in perspective, changing in, I don't know, being smart. Like you don't, as you were talking about with the expeditions, you don't want to go and kill yourself because you want to keep pushing the limits like the base jumpers do. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it's all a different challenge. But mate, um, I really appreciate you talking and having the time to talk to me today. Um, I think it's pretty cool. It covers so many different bases from your, your expeditions to your racing to how you're sort of running different um, surf ski. I'm oh, sorry, surf ski. Uh, windsurf schools in Greece and Venezuela. It's uh, been, yeah, been amazing to talk to you. Like you've got so many good stories. I'm sure we can continue to talk for hours, but uh, I think we'll wrap it up there. Yeah, we we we'd already talked for two hours. I think. So yeah. It's, it's by like this, yes. Yeah. That's yeah. Crazy. Thanks. I mean, it, it's also fun to be interviewed by somebody like you because you know you're 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 the best in in what you do, and um, you obviously know all the inside so it's 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 uh, different than somebody who's asking the question from the outside so yeah it's very cool thanks yeah oh mate i'm always really interested in in different people's like mindsets and why they do things and and how they sort of challenge themselves in different ways so, because we're all very good at different things and, and some of us maybe at the moment i can i can maybe paddle a board faster than some other people but i definitely can't do what you do i, I can't see myself paddling a, a thousand miles down the yukon or something like that anytime soon i think it's just well beyond me but um it's yeah it's just cool to sort of be able to tap into different people and, and how they sort of inspire me in different ways so it's been really cool and i just want to say a little bit to everybody out there who has been watching and listening to boothcast if you want to uh listen to these uh, apple Podcasts or spotify or any of your other favorite podcast channels you can listen to these um if you want to watch these go to my booth on facebook there's a whole booth cast section where you can actually see our facial expressions and you can see us talking to each other. Um, but if that interests you, um, that'd be amazing. Thank you for all the support. This one's been brought to you by Starboard and I can't wait to talk to you and bring you the next one. So Bart, thank you so much for coming on and I'll talk to you very soon.
Thank you.